I would like to introduce to you storyteller Laura Packer. Laura was born talking in Philadelphia, according to her mother. She just came out talking. As a child, she loved exploring the woods there, and uh, Laura uh, noted that she loved to pretend she was in the middle of nowhere, or sometimes in the middle earth of Narnia. And she grew up in a house full of stories, with her father being a writer and mother being a librarian. And she got her degree in folklore. And she's been telling stories since her early 20s. And since then, she's been a mover and a shaker of the storytelling uh, culture, nationally and internationally. She's been spinning stories at First Night in Boston and at the National Story, uh, Storytelling Festival, at conferences, and at international gatherings. And she has also hosted a number of storytelling venues as well. And Laura doesn't mess around when it comes to conviction and what she has to share about stories, whether it's talking about sexism in NASA or, uh, as she noted, that she has even told stories naked and it wasn't as bad as she feared. <laughs> and when asked, why do we need stories in this world, Laura said, human beings are made of stories. We understand the world through the stories we tell and hear face to face. It's how we teach our children, convey our values, transcend boundaries of age, class and color. I look forward to hearing what Laura has in stories for us this morning. Please help me give a warm welcome to Laura Packer. He was 19. And who knows who they are when they're 19? I mean, come on! He was 19 and sure, he lived in his parents' basement and he knew that was a stereotype. But he figured that's what stereotypes were for, right? They gave you a place to just kind of stay while you figured out what your own type really was. And he saw all his friends who went off to college, and he knew he did not want to work that hard. So he had a job. He lived in his parents' basement, and he had a job, and that was OK. It was good enough for now. He was just so tired of everyone saying, young man, what are you going to do with your life? Because he was 19. He didn't know yet, all right? He liked his job well enough, at least. He worked at the local Quickie Lube, working with cars. He worked with his hands. He liked working with his hands, and he liked it that someone would drive their car in. He'd <clears throat> loosen a couple bolts, the oil would just ribbon down, and then he made a quick little difference in their lives. It was satisfying work, and when he was done, he was done. He liked cars. He thought they were kind of cool, the way the engines rumbled or squealed. And if you listen to them just right, it's almost like they were talking to you. He figured that this wasn't a bad way to be for right now while he figured the rest of it out. He just wished everyone would stop asking him, what do you want? Well, one day, he was on his way to work. He was driving his mother's car. It was much better when he got to drive his mother's car as opposed to the days where she drove him to work. So he's driving along, and he's really not thinking of much of anything. He's driving along, and then, oh, he sees it. He sees her. He pulls over, and there it is, a beautiful, pristine, black 1969 Camaro. I mean, come on, a 1969 Camaro, black with a for sale sign in the window. And he just can't help but get out of his car and look. He walks around this beautiful machine. He runs his hand over her curves. He had never seen anything so beautiful in his whole life. And he knows there's no way he could afford this car. I mean, sure, he has a little money in the bank, and he has a little money under his mattress. He's supposed to be saving for college, but oh, this car. A guy walks out of the house. He's got a toothpick in his mouth. He says, hey, kid, you like what you see? It's not bad, he says. The guy says, you want to take her out for a spin? Now, he knows he's going to be late for work if he does this, but he doesn't care. This is his one chance to drive a 1969 Camaro because there's no way he can buy this car. So yeah, sure, I wouldn't mind. The guy tosses him the keys, he catches them, he opens the door, he sits down on that pristine upholstery and slides the key into the lock. He turns it on and he listens to the engine go, 
She shakes under his hands. He pulls the car out onto the street and drives around the block the whole time, feeling all of that contained power. And he thinks, this is the best moment of my entire life. <laughs> he pulls the car back to the house and turns it off. The silence is deafening now. The door closes with a satisfying thump, and he tosses the keys to the guy, and he knows he shouldn't even bother asking, but he has to ask. So he says, uh, how much do you want for her? The guy looks at him, and he shifts the toothpick over to the other side of his mouth. Then he names a price. It's just under what he has in the bank and under his bed. It leaves him just enough money for registration and insurance, and he can't believe it. So he says, um, yeah. I, 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 I think I could do that, hating how his voice is cracking. And, but but, but I, I, I have to go to work. And the guy says, kid, let's shake on it. And he holds out his hand. And the kid says, how do I know you're not going to sell her while I'm gone? And the guy says, kid, we're going to shake on it. It's what men do. <laughs> he shakes the guy's hand, feeling how big and meaty it is in his own. And then he drives to work, and the whole day at work, while he's under there <clears throat> changing oil and watching it ribbon down, he's thinking to himself, oh my god, I'm going to get a 1969 Camaro. And he drives home as fast as he can, gets all of his money out from underneath the mattress, goes to the bank, empties out his bank account from the ATM, which really tells you how much he had in there. And then he goes back to the guy's house. The car is still there. He didn't sell it while he was gone. He knocks on the door. They exchange money and do the paperwork in the guy's kitchen. And then the guy gives him the keys and says, so a uh, kid. How are you going to get it home? I see you have two cars here. He hadn't thought about that. The guy says, all right, look, kid, tell you what. You drive your car. Let me drive her one last time to your house, and then you bring me back home. That's what they do. They drive to his house, and then he drives the, bike, the guy back home in his mother's car. And then he goes back to his house, and he looks at that beautiful 1969 Camaro, his car, sitting there. It's more than he can take. His parents come out wondering why he's just standing out front, and his mother says, what is that doing here? Did you buy this car? Did you spend all of your college savings on that car? Is it going to leave oil stains in our driveway? And his father just puts his arm around her and says, son, it's a beautiful car. And she says, what are you talking about? He just wasted all his money. And his father says, shh, sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> And he leads her back into the house. And there he is with his car. The next morning, he gets up earlier and more on time than he ever has in his entire life. He goes down to the registry, registers the car, finds an insurance agent, gets insurance, and then he runs back home. He sits down in his car. She is his legally now. He slides the key into the lock, and he goes for a drive. He loves the way she sounds. It's like she's talking to him. He loves the way she feels around him and underneath him. He drives down the street, and the first place he goes is to work, where he shows off his new car to all the guys. They look so jealous. It feels good. And then he drives down Main Street, his arm on the window seat and kind of leaning back. He figures girls are looking at him, so from time to time he just waves a little bit, hoping somebody notices. <laughs> And then it's time to go to work. So he goes to the quickie lube, does his job for the day, and then he drives home, and he thinks, this was the best day of my life. He loves this car. And the next day, after work, he decides to go for a, a drive again. He drives down the main drag, and they, he turns down a side street, and he thinks, I haven't even looked in the glove box yet. So at a stop sign, he kind of leans over and taps the button to open up the glove box. And then all of a sudden, greasy, oily smoke starts coming out of the glove box and filling the car. No, 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 he thinks, and he turns off the car, slams it into park, leaps out, and throws open the hood, expecting to see his beloved engine burning up. But there's no smoke. He puts down the hood, goes back to the car. The smoke is gone, but instead there's this girl sitting in the car. <laughs> A woman, actually, he, he looks at her and he says, what are you doing in my car? And she kind of ignores him, checks her nails. What are you doing in my car, lady? Get out of my car. She doesn't say anything. So he sits down and he thinks, what, what, how did she get here? Is she, is she, is she prostitute? How, how did she get, what, what does she want? And she says, all right, kid, what do you want? What do I want? What are you doing in my car? Kid, come on, calm down. 
You opened up the glove box. Here I am. What do you want? <laughs> Lady, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you really as stupid as you look? Come on, kid. You got the car. You opened the glove box. I came out. Three wishes. Boom. We're done. He looked at her. Now, as a kid, he'd heard stories about things like this, and he knew they were all fairy tales, they were lies, things like this. They just didn't happen in the real world. But here's this lady sitting in his car telling him he has three wishes. Right, this was some kind of joke. His, ki his friends were so jealous, they put something in his car, set up this woman to do something. So he looked at her and he said, you know, lady, you know what I want? I want you to get out of my car. She says, okay, and like that, she vanished. Not like she opened the door and disappeared stepped out, nothing. She just was gone. The glove box was closed. He sat there for a while, decided that this couldn't be happening, and drove home. But you know how it is when something happens and it kind of gets under your skin? You can't really stop thinking about it? Yeah, this was one of those things. So after a few days, he went to the library, and he got out some books of fairy tales, the ones he read when he was a kid, and all that stuff, and yeah, that whole three wishes thing, it never worked out well. They always had a way of twisting those wishes, and this was fake anyway, right? It couldn't be real, but he couldn't stop thinking about it. All right, so say maybe it was real. He's at work, changing an oil pan and watching the oil stream down. Say it was real. What did he want? He's at home eating his dinner, watching TV. What would he want? What would he wish for? He had no idea what he would wish for because he was 19. He didn't know what he wanted with his life. He took his friends out for drives and kept the glove box locked. And whenever they tried to open it, he just told them it was broken. But he couldn't stop thinking about it. He was 19. All right, all right. Should I wish for money? No. Because in the fairy tales, that never works well. You never get your money in a good way. Should I wish for world peace? No, that always ends badly. I've seen Twilight Zone. I know what happens. Should I wish for girls? Uh, no, then I won't know if they like me or just it's the wish. He had no idea what to wish for. But you know, he was 19. So one day after work, he went out for a drive. And he drove until he came to Walmart and pulled into the distant corner of the parking lot, where it's kind of dim. He turned off the car and listened to the engine tick, 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 as it cooled down, leaned over and opened up the glove box. And with scarcely any smoke, there she was, not looking at him, checking her nails. She pulled down and looked in the mirror, started checking her teeth. All right, kid, she said, what do you want? And then, I have to tell you, he tried. He really tried. In his sexiest voice, he said, you. I want you. Are you kidding me? No, 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 really. You, 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 you asked what I wanted, and I, I, I want you. I mean, she was kind of cute. You. Oh, come on, kid. There's so many other things you could ask for, and you're asking for this? Uh, that, 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 that's what I said. He was beginning to doubt himself by now. All right, she said. Let's go. And he began to realize that wasn't really quite what he meant, but soon enough, really sooner than it takes to tell you about it, it was over. And she disappeared like that. And there he was, sitting in his car, thinking, that wasn't what I meant at all. Well, he kept that glove box closed for weeks. And he tried not to think about it. He just tried so hard not to think about it. But it's like a mosquito bite. The more you don't scratch it, the more it itches. And so he went to work every day, and he hung out with his friends, and he went for drives. But all he could think about was, what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? And he just didn't know. Finally, one night, late, after his shift ended, after he'd been out with friends, after he'd watched TV until he couldn't stand TV anymore, he went out and he got in his car and he began to drive. He drove down the street he grew up on and he watched the yellow pools of light pass by slowly. And then he turned onto the main street. He saw all the shops that he'd always known, the places he'd been since he was a little boy, the places he would always remember. 
and the places that he really wanted to forget. And he drove down the main drag and then turned till he got to the highway. The car loved the on-ramp to the highway, that long, smooth, banked curve. And he drove up that curve, pressing on the accelerator, listening to the engine growl. And then he was on the highway. And then he drove. He watched the road in front of him, that long line of blackness broken only by the hyphens of white lines. And he drove. And he drove until he was far out of the city. He drove through towns with names he'd never heard of before. He drove until he was farther away from home than he'd ever been before. And then he took an exit ramp and curved down off the highway. And now he drove on a rural road up and down and around like it was some kind of roller coaster. And he drove until finally he stopped at the edge of a field. He turned off the, the engine and listened to it going tick, 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 as it cooled down. Through the windscreen, he could see stars, more stars than he had ever seen in his entire life. And he looked out into that night. And then he leaned over and opened the glove box. There she was. All right, kid. What do you want, she said, and this better be good. I mean, I hope it's, hope it's better than last time anyway. <laughs> I don't know, he said. What? You don't know? You called me out here and you don't know what you want? Do you think I spend all my time in your car? Don't you think I have better things to do than to come here and talk to you and listen to you say that you don't know what you want? Lady, 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 he said. Lady, please, just listen to me. She turned and looked at him, really, for the first time. I'm listening. Lady, I'm 19 years old. I don't know what I want. But I got to figure, no offense intended, you've been in this business a long time. And you've heard a lot of wishes and a lot of people talking about what they want. So here is what I want. I want you to give me whatever it is that you think will make me happiest. No tricks, no trying to make me unhappy, just whatever you think it is that will be best for me. Are you kidding me, kid? Do you know how much responsibility that is to give some other person? Lady, he said, lady, I'm going crazy with this. I don't want this wish. I want you to give me a gift. She looked at him again. And whatever it was he saw in her, she saw in his face must have answered her question because she said, all right, kid, your wish is granted. Thank you. He got out of the car and tossed the keys on the seat and then walked off into the night. Well, it's been years now. And there he is in his own garage, looking at the long light slant down the end of the day. He's cleaning off the tools because that's what you do when you have your own garage. You keep everything clean and neat and tidy. He sent the guy who works with him home. They finished up for the day. It was a good day. The work is done. They sent the customer home happy. And he didn't need him here anymore, so instead he can just enjoy the silence, that rich smell of gasoline and oil. He looks out. And he sees there in the distance, what is that? Oh, it's a black 1969 Camaro driving by. And he thinks, I had one of those when I was a kid. I loved that car. I wonder whatever happened to it. And then it turns and begins driving down the street to his garage. The car stops, and a young woman gets out. He looks at her, and he thinks, huh, if I were 20 years younger, I'd want me some of that, but not now. She walks over to him and says, hey. You got time for an oil change? Sure, he says. Bring the car in. She drives the car up as smooth as can be onto the lift, and he holds the lift down, and it goes right up. He steps underneath the car and <clears throat> loosens the bolt to the oil pan. The oil ribbons down. She looks at him, and she says, hey, you're pretty good at this. Oh, I've been doing it a long time. She sees the picture of his family on, on his desk, his wife and his two daughters. She says, that your family? And he says, oh, lady, they're my family and they're the center of my universe. One of my daughters, she wants to be a ballerina. The other one, she says she's going to be a runner. But they are the light of my life. 
She watches him while he fiddles and changes things, and then he lowers the car down. And then when he's almost done wiping the last specks of grease off of the edge of the oil pan and the oil filter, she says, hey, mister, are you happy? He looks at her and says, oh, lady, this, this is everything I ever wanted. Thank you. Four short stories about beauty and food. One, I knew. How could I not know? Of course I recognized my own stepmother when she came to me and offered me the poisoned comb and the girdle that was too tight and the apple, that beautiful apple. But how could I not take a bite hoping for sweetness? And when it got stuck in my throat and I saw her face following my, my, my own as I fell down, the only thing that I regretted was that the inside of the glass coffin was mirrored. Two. I wake from a dream. I wake from a dream of such incandescent beauty that I try desperately to hold onto it, and I cannot. It's gone, a fleeting memory, and I feel the coolness of the floorboards under my feet as I get up, knowing I will not be able to sleep again that night. In the darkness, the blue flame of the gas heats the water, and when finally the kettle boils, I pour it into the cup, and I stand and watch the sunrise, the golden light of dawn echoing the golden tea. Three, when you make bread, first you take dried yeast and pour water and give it sugar to eat, and it becomes alive. You create life, and all of a sudden, your bowl is burgeoning with little living things that eat the sugar and belch out such a wonderful fragrance. You mix in flour and salt and knead it with your hands, all sticky at first until finally it becomes a smooth, living thing. You let it rise, and then you take your fist, and you take all of your aggression and pain and sorrow and fatigue from the day, and you punch down the bread and knead it again. And all of the yeast that has belched out all of that good air collapses in on itself, and you get to smell their breath. You let the bread rise again, now shaped into loaves, and then you slide it into a hot oven, trying not to think of the yeast that's being killed. When the bread slides out, you break it open, and again that steamy breath rises up, and you remember that out of death and life comes beauty. Four, you, each and every one of you, you would have eaten the apple too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Trying to write a song that wasn't really working very well, and I started this finger picking and uh, got this warm feeling that something was in the air. And <clears throat> so I started writing this song. <clears throat> And uh, it's kind of wouldn't let me go till I finished it. So hopefully I finished enough for you to hear it. And uh, I would like to dedicate this song to uh, all those people who, with the tiniest shred of evidence, build these impenetrable structures of belief that a pharaoh would be proud of, one that entombs them as well. It's called The Prisoner. Walking down the path of my own righteousness Thinking I have all of the answers With my perception limited To the life of just one man Shying away from questions that lie Beyond the reach of my candle Riding high on conclusions that I keep drawing in the sand When will I stop demanding that you take my side 
When will I start dancing and romancing my life while I still have time? Lost in a hallway of mirrors scattered throughout my mind. It's clear to me if I get nearer, I can shatter them with my own hand. But unless I'm willing to let go of all I've learned till now, the color of truth will never show in a black and white wasteland. When will I stop demanding that you take my side? When will I start dancing and romancing my life? While I still have time When will I let go Of all I've learned till now When will I begin to see The prison is my own mind Has been for some time Over the ocean a rainbow shines All across the sky I know my pot of gold lies And the magic I will find When I leave prison behind When will I let go Of all I've learned till now When will I begin to see Dancing in my life While I still have time While I still have time When will I let go? Climb out of the shadows When will I find out how To wake up in this dream now Wake up in this dream now Wake up in this dream now.